This morning, we're considering the trap of temptation. And uh, a passage uh, a passage we've spoken of in, in the past, Joshua 7, beginning at verse 1. Let's read through this story this morning and, and see what God wants to say to us. It says, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore the angel of the Lord burned the anger, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or three thousand men need go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. <laughs> So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shabari and struck them down on the descent. So the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, and they have taken, they have even taken some of the things under the ban, and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel said, there are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. In the morning then you shall come near by your tribes and it shall be that the tribe which the lord takes by lot shall come near by families and the family which the lord shall come near by households and the household which the lord takes shall come near by man by man it shall be that the one who is taken with the things under the man shall be burned with fire he and all that belongs to him because he has transgressed the covenant of the lord and because he has committed a disgraceful thing in israel so Joshua arose early in the morning and brought Israel near by tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the family of Judah near, and he took the family of the Zerahites, and he brought the family of the Zerahites near man by man, and Zabdi was taken. He brought his household near man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered at Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw the spoil, a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a bar of gold, fifty shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. They took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before the Lord. <clears throat> then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belongs to him. They brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? 
The Lord will trouble you this day, and all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones, they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this day. Verse 12 again is the key verse. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. I don't know that we're aware that a single sin can potentially ruin our success, can ruin our families, uh, a lifetime friendship can be destroyed, a reputation. Temptations are all around us and, and, and waiting to destroy us if we give in to them. Do we remember the words in Genesis 4, 7, if you do well, Will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Our passage today teaches how great the consequences of temptation really are if we give in, and teaches us how important it is to resist temptation. We begin this morning by talking about that, temptation. Number one, temptation. Israel has just been in, involved in a very great military conquest. They witnessed the amazing defeat of the city of Jericho. Can you imagine how wonderful that defeat was to see after walking those seven days uh, around the city of Jericho and seven times on day seven and, and, and they shouted and blew the trumpets and the city walls fell flat and they went in and took the city. They, they conquered Jericho without firing one shot. Uh, and, and, and now at this point in the story, they're still basking in the glow of that great event. And I imagine at, at this point that they, they were just sure that we're unbeatable. You know, nobody can stop us. They're certain every obstacle in the path, it'll be moved out of the way. Our God is, is powerful. Verse one here reveals the truth that God is upset with Israel. Israel thought that everything was all right. They thought that they were standing on the edge of a great string of victories that would see them conquering the entire land that God had promised them. Verse 1 starts out though, but the sons of Israel acted how? How did they act? Unfaithfully. This word, but, at the beginning, that contraction signals a change of fortunes for Israel because of this unfaithfulness. Up, up until now, they've been blessed. They were used greatly of the Lord. Now things have changed. They thought they were unstoppable, but what they didn't know was that there was a serious problem in their midst, a, a, a kind of cancer. There was this one man among them who was causing the whole problem for the entire family of God. This, the same kind of thing is still possible today, amen? One person can cause problems for many. Isn't that right? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. If you hit your thumb with a hammer... Affects all of you, doesn't it? Affects all of you. It's even worse if you hit your toe, step your toe on something. Ever broken a toe? Late at night, you're stumbling around. You didn't put on your house shoes. You walked around barefoot and you got your little toe. I broke my little toe once. It still affects my whole body. I'll be driving at this time of the year as the weather changes and it's telling the weather. Some of you know what I'm talking about. In other words, we're all members of one body. We all know that when one member of the body has problems, it causes problems for all of us. We all suffer with it. And the same thing is true in the body of Christ. Your, your, your spiritual temperature, if you have a temperature, 
the spiritual temperature, that has a profound effect on the entire body of Christ. You're, you're not an island unto yourself. What, what you do affects the whole church body. And, and we'll see this truth illustrated in our passage this morning as we continue here. Consider the circumstances of Israel. God promised Abraham he's going to make him a great nation. But a nation has to possess land to be a nation. The Israelites had been roaming around in the desert for some 40 years. Why were they roaming for 40 years? You remember what was the problem? Sin. Sin? Idolatry. You remember the golden calf? You know, remember all that? The broken tablets of stone? Because of sin, they've been roaming around. And finally, Joshua replaces Moses and the new generation arose to now finally go in and conquer the promised land. He was, God was fulfilling His promise and bringing Israel to this great land to become a great nation. However, Achan wanted just a little more. You know? All these blessings that they, they're receiving now how could he want more? But with all that God has given us, how can we want more? How can we cheat on our taxes? Or, or how can we steal something that nobody will notice? How can we look at things on the internet we shouldn't see? How can we do so many things that we do with all that God has given us? Temptation causes us to take our focus off of God, His amazing plan, His abundant provision for us, and to satisfy our own temporary lust. If we look back in the previous chapter, chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, we see God's command. You know, that ban that it talks about? Here's the explanation of that. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that in it belongs to the Lord. All that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban, so that you do not covet them, and take some of the things under the ban. And make the camp of Israel accursed, and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Pretty specific here, isn't it? God's command is clear. You know, Israel had this specific command from God when they overtook Jericho, they were to leave certain spoils as a sacrifice to God. Achan didn't obey. He, he disobeyed. He did the exact opposite. He stole a sacred robe. He stole some silver and some gold. And, and those silver and gold things should have gone into the temple. They're God's. They're not His. That robe should have been left. Reminds us of Adam and Eve, I think, who, who were given abundance. Think about Adam. They had everything in the Garden of Eden. God gave them one command. Don't eat of that one tree. Just one tree. You can eat all the rest from all the rest of them. But leave that tree alone. Just resist one tree. And that they still fell. What did the Apostle Paul say about temptation in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? Do you remember that verse? No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. The Spirit convicts us of sin and, and gives us strength to resist temptation. And yet we often overlook God's commands and satisfy our own desires, our own lusts. It, it, it's, it's our fleshly desires that we're talking about here. James explains it very clearly in the first chapter of the letter of James. It says in verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed what? By his own lusts. Achan followed this same pattern. I saw it. I coveted it. I desired it. I wanted to have it. And so I took it. And there they are in my tent. I, I, I knew I shouldn't, so I dug a hole and put it under. You know, and, and really kind of proved that I know what I 
did was wrong by digging the hole and hiding it. You know, we must take responsibility and recognize that our desires cause us to sin. We, we must never hide like Achan or Adam or Eve. Eve you remember Adam and Eve, they put on those leaf aprons. They were trying to hide their guilt, hide their sin. If, if, if we fall into the trap of our lust, our own lust, we, we mustn't divert responsibility or hide our failure. Somebody once said, little sins are not like an inch of candle which should soon expires, but they resemble a trail of powder which takes the fire until at last the barrels burst asunder and a huge explosion reveals the sin. A poet wrote these words. It's called, I took a walk with sin. I took a walk with sin one day. I, I thought it would not fall. I would not fall. I thought I would not fall. He walked what seems like miles away, not bothering me at all. What's the harm in walking, I asked. He agreed and then drew near. This walk will not last long, he said. I'm scarcely even here. Then more and more his speech progressed of pleasure, of gods, of fun. Before I could speak no or yes, I had already begun. In the end, I was alone again. Guilty and hurt, I wept. But I learned the rule of resisting sin. I must never take the first step. How true that is. But following this, you have the consequence of the sin. You see, to begin with, Israel was a determined people. As I just mentioned, they were, they were still basking in their victory at Jericho when they, when they began looking towards Ai. They were certain that this little town, Ai was, was a small place, wouldn't be a problem at all for their great army. They were a confident people. But a closer look reveals their confidence was misplaced. In verse 3, they believe that just a few soldiers are needed to secure a victory in little Ai. And, and we see Israel being guilty of resting in their past successes. They didn't realize it, but they were living through one of the most dangerous times uh, anybody could live through in their life. The time just after a great spiritual victory is a very dangerous time. Often, like Israel, we'll, we'll be com confident and, and really overconfident and believe that you know, we can handle any battle that comes our way. No problems. But we need to remember always Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. But when we believe like that, we're, we're about to suffer our greatest defeat. Confidence is a good thing as long as our confidence is in the right place. When, when we're walking with our hope, our confidence in the Lord, we will be victorious. Amen? But when our confidence is in our own ability, and, and when the power of our flesh, you know, we're walking in the power of our flesh, then we're destined to fail. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Also, Israel was a defeated people. When, when Israel went up to Ai, they suffered a terrible loss. Terrible loss. You need to keep going here. You've, you've missed something. There's the determined people. There's Proverbs. Corinthians. Now we're the defeated people. This must have been really devastating to them, you know. They, they suffered this loss of 36. 36 of their soldiers were killed. The ramifications of this defeat were so severe. Uh, because there was in sin in the camp, because of Achan's sin, 36 men died. That means 36 sins. 36 sets of children lost their fathers. 36 mothers lost their sons. 36 wives became widows. It was a, it was a high price to pay for sin. And, and when we take the time to look more closely at their actions, it's easy to see that 
They made several mistakes here in, in this effort towards Ai. Nowhere in this passage, first of all, nowhere does it hint, even hint that Joshua and the people of Israel sought God's will in dealing with Ai. They just decided what they would do all by themselves. They didn't even pray about the matter. If they had, I think God at that time would have revealed the problem before the people died. How many times are we guilty of, of jumping ahead of the Lord and His will and, and rushing headlong in, into life and, and, and expect the Lord to bail us out of the messes that we make because we didn't take the time to ask God for His direction? It's far better to, to consult God before we make the mistake and, 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 you know, than it is to expect Him to clean up the mess after the fact. The next mistake they made is that they didn't take the Ark of the Covenant into the battle. The ark symbolized the presence of God, the power of God with them. And they went into battle in their own strength without the power of God. And, and what do you suppose happens when we, every time we do that? We fail, right? We try to live the Christian life and fight the flesh and the devil in our own power and we fail time after time after time. James tells us, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And what happens is we resist the devil and fight the devil before we ever get right with God. We've got to start by submitting to God. You know? We, we, we try to live in our own power and it doesn't work. We, we don't take the time to strengthen our walk with God. When, when we're walking with, with the Lord and His Word as we should be, you know, every day we're praying to God, every day we're reading His Word. Uh, Bible study and prayer are, are the foundation of our Christian walk. And if that's not a part of our life, how do we expect to have any power, have any strength against the devil? You know, we can be confident in the battles of life and face our enemies in the strength of God if that's our foundation. We, 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 we fall when we fail to utilize the whole armor of God that Paul speaks of in Ephesians 6. Let me ask you, back in... In King David's time, back before David became king, remember he, he fought Goliath. Little David, little shepherd boy. Who killed the giant? Did David kill the giant or did God kill the giant? David answers that, that question for us in 1 Samuel 17, 47. He says, and, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. God killed the giant. David knew that. He knew, I'm, you know, I'm just a little guy. I fought bears, and I fought wolves that tried to take the, the lambs, and if it wasn't for God's power, it would have never happened. The third mistake they made is that Israel had their confidence in their own power and not in the Lord. They, they weren't walking by faith, but they were guilty of trusting themselves, trusting what they can do. How many times have we suffered defeat because we believe we could, you know, don't worry about this one, God, I got this one. I can take care of this. You know, we can't take care of it. We can't do the job. We all need the Lord if we want to enjoy spiritual victory in our lives. Philippians 4.13, I can do how many things through Him? All things through Him who strengthens me. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. You can't do a thing. The fourth mistake Israel made was that Israel wasn't willing to put everything they had into the job they were called to do. In verse 3, the spies who went to Ai returned and they said, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. You understand here that the city of Ai was located about 1,700 feet above sea level. And Israel's camp at this time in Gilgal was located at about 800 feet below sea level. And so they would have had to make a climb, an ascent of 2,500 feet. It would have been a very long, tiring climb, and the people of Israel couldn't see the point in all, all of the fighting men having to work so hard because it's just such a small place. They didn't see the task at hand as being worth the effort that it would require. 
And when we start looking for ways to get out of our responsibilities before the Lord, that's when we're headed directly for trouble. He is worth every ounce of our effort. And then next we see that Israel was a distressed people. A distressed people. After their terrible defeat at the hands of Ai, the people of Israel are feeling uh, the same fear that their enemies experienced on several occasions. And, and this is one of the major problems with sin. It defeats you and, and leaves you feeling broken and used and confused. Nothing is right in the life of a believer while there is sin in their heart. While you know there's sin in your life. Have you ever had a time like this in your, in your spiritual life? I, I believe I have. And most of the time they result from allowing other things to displace God in my life. James says this when, when he continues his explanation of temptation in chapter, uh, in chapter 1 verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it, it brings forth death. The Apostle Paul also wrote in, in Romans 6, 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And so what was the consequence of Achan's sin? We find two things here. We find that it was shared. One man sinned and yet an entire nation su suffered. Israel lost 36 men in battle, and most importantly, they lost the Lord's favor. Secondly, the consequence was specific. The Lord not only punished the nation, but also condemned Achan. The Israelites, the verses here tell us, stoned Achan and his entire family, burned their bodies, and in this, of course, suggests to us the ultimate punishment for sin, eternal separation from God in hell. The harsh reality of, of hell is a natural result of sin. Billy Graham one time said of hell that God will never send anybody to hell. If any man goes to hell, he goes by his own free choice. C.S. Lewis made this comment. He said, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. And we all perhaps have heard the 17th century proverb that says, Hell is wherever heaven is not. The doctrine of future punishment is, is so clearly taught in God's word that none of us can escape it. it is, it's not that God wants to threaten people or to frighten people into being good. One commentator put it like this. He said, it is the last resort of God's wisdom and holiness in it, God takes no delight, yet the necessities of good government, the maintenance of order under rightful authority, and the highest regard for the welfare of the good require this ultimate vindication of righteousness at the expense of incorrigibly wicked. The expense of the incorrigibly wicked. However, I want us to see clearly, clearly today that there is also, thirdly, reconciliation. Verse 26 again said, They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Uh, uh, many years later in the Bible, the prophet Hosea mentions this same valley. It says, Then I will give her vineyards. Hosea 2.15 I will give her vineyards from there. The valley of Achor is a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. The promise is that this place of trouble could become a door of hope. It will be when Israel returns to the, their heavenly father who, who brought them into the promised land and, and turns them away from, from false idols and, and false gods. Uh, the same is true about us. Concerning us, we need to understand this applies. If we'll come to the Lord in, in humble repentance, those sins that have the potential to cause us so much trouble can be taken care of today. This service can literally become a door of hope for you right now if you come to Jesus for the cleansing that you need. Some, some things can't be hidden. If you have an aching heart... <laughs> 
pun intended, an aching heart, an aching heart, God has the cure for that heart. <coughs> if you have sin hidden in your life, the Lord can forgive you and can restore you for His glory. How do, you, how do we reconcile if, if we've been tempted and have succumbed? Achan hid his sin, but God calls us to deal with it, to confess it. How can we deal with it? Three-step process. First, realization. Before we can deal with sin, we must realize its presence, realize that we've sinned. Only after Israel lost lives and, and favor with God did Joshua turn to the Lord for reconciliation. It, it, it always costs us to sin. Whether we lose our testimony, whether we lose our families or our ministry or our favor with God, our, our loss is meant to bring us to realize our sin. The second step after we realize our sin is riddance. Riddance. The Lord told Joshua, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. When the Israelites found the guilty person, they stoned him, they killed him, his family, destroyed all of his possessions to ensure the complete riddance of his evil legacy. You recall that Jesus said, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, Cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than it is to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. He, what he means by that is to cast that sin from you. Cut it. Cut the sin out. He's not talking about little, literal hands and feet and eyes. He's talking about literal sin. Literal evil in your life. I'm reminded of a story I read this week about a businessman who, because of his business, he happened to be traveling. He had had a very bad experience at one particular hotel. It causes me to remember some past experiences I've, I've had as I've traveled various places in my lifetime. Fortunately, I've never had exactly this kind of situation happen. When this fellow climbed into his bed, put his legs under the cover, and felt a bug running up his leg. So he throws back the covers, jumps from the bed, and guess what? That lone bug wasn't alone. There were numerous other little critters between the sheets, and although the man was given another room, he still was not satisfied with the situation. When he got back home, he wrote a letter to the hotel's corporate office. Within a few weeks, he received a letter directly from the company's president. Very flattering remarks and penitent words. The president made it quite clear the problem should have never occurred and that he would make sure that it would never happen again. Well, he was beginning to feel somewhat vindicated by the letter until a, a small little post-it note fell out of the envelope. The secretary inadvertently left her business, you know, her boss's direct directions concerning this man, and it says simply what? Send this man the bug letter. <laughs> we aren't dealing with our sin when we just try to cover our tracks after getting caught. What needs to happen involves a commitment to correct our ways. Too often, I'm afraid, we just send God the bug letter. Yeah, I know I did wrong, God. I'm sorry about that. Please forgive. We pray with, with flaming words of shame and remorse, but we too often are already formulating our plans to commit the exact same offense again. You see, this, this final step is tied to the previous one. You must rid yourself of the sin and the intention to sin. Rid yourself of the sin and the intention to sin if you are to have true repentance. Israel saw the pain and death that sin can bring. Their riddance of sin marked their personal repentance and dedication to resist temptation. And, and we see 
and feel the awful effects of sin every day. Social injustice, adultery, disease, hatred, you, you know, you could go on and on. The results of sin. And list those. Yet do these things cause us to turn from sin, to truly repent? Or are we in our, in our confession of it formulating, well, I'm going to do that next week. You know, I heard a story from quite a number of years ago now. I, I think it illustrates quite well what God's Word is trying to tell us here. Governor Neff of, of the state of Texas many years ago, he had received an invitation to speak at one of the penitentiaries in that state of Texas. He spoke to the assembled prisoners and after his, his speech he said that he would be around for a while and would be willing to listen to anything that any of the convicts might want to tell him and he would take as, as much time as they needed and uh, anything they wanted to tell him would be kept in strictest confidence. The convicts began to come one at a time, one after another. They told the story of how they had been unjustly sentenced, were innocent, and they wanted to get out as soon as possible. Finally, one, came, one man came, though, and he said to him, Governor Neff, I don't want to take much of your time. I only want to say that I really did what they convicted me of. But I've been here a number of years. I believe I've paid my debt to society and that if I were to be released, I would be able to live an upright life and show myself worthy of your mercy. Who do you think Governor Nat pardoned? That man. A man truly penitent. He had realized his sin, admitted his sin, ridded himself of continuing in it, and had determined that he would now live a truly repentant life. Perhaps repentance was perhaps best defined by a, a little girl who said, repentance means to be sorry enough to quit. My challenge for all of us this morning is to go home and rid yourself of any temptations. Refuse gossiping or getting drunk or throw away those magazines, those videos, delete the pornography from your computer or other files that you really shouldn't have, whatever it is, destroy whatever is devoted to destruction in your life, whatever temptation you have succumbed to, whatever it is, destroy it, and if you sin, turn to Jesus, and, and He's the one who paid the ultimate price of death for us, and, and commit to resist temptation, through His Spirit, after you've confessed those sins to Him, commit to repent of them, to quit them and not do them anymore. And this is the only way to escape the trap of temptation. What is God saying to you today? Come to Him while there's time. Come before judgment falls. Come so that renewal and revival can come into your family and can come into our church. Turn to the Lord today. Why this message of repentance? I believe that repentant people, contrite people will make better voters. Better people. That God will be able to use us in ways we hadn't imagined if we are committed to Him and committed to His Word, to spend time in His Word and in prayer, talking with Him. Having confessed our sin, gotten right with it, and now seek to live a life set apart for His service. We're going to sing, Lord, I'm coming home. If you need to make a decision for the Lord, I'll be here to receive you. Let's all of us stand and, and confess and commit ourselves to God as we sing. people that really don't know God, don't, don't give themselves to God. Now, we are told by the pollsters who, who take those kinds of religious polls, we think of other kinds of polls at this time of the year, but those who, who ask people 
spiritual questions that we live in a very spiritual nation. People consider themselves uh, spiritual people, but, but yet we don't find them in God's house seeking to serve Him and sacrifice to Him. It behooves us as the people of God to be very diligent to be right with God. To be uh, not hypocrites as they often name us, but to be people who genuinely love God and serve God and share His message diligently. So I'm just wanting to challenge you today to double check, you know, get with God, get along with God and make sure that you're right with God. Uh, we'll be in the public eye as we as we go vote. We'll be among among our our fellow citizens, so we should be a, a good example to them. Show them Christ's love and to uh, to uh, bless God in everything we do, in every step we make. Brother Ted, would you bless us with prayer this morning, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing that you have received today. We thank you that you give us the privilege to come here to worship you and praise you in song, to hear your word proclaimed. Father, we just pray that it would touch our hearts, that we would open our hearts to receive your word. And Heavenly Father, we would not only receive it, but then we would become doers of the word. Father, I ask your blessings upon each one here. And I ask you to bring us back tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Dave will lead us in prayer right over here after the service. If you can stay, please come be a part of the prayer time. Thank you.